So today we kick off a brand new series of messages from the book of Psalms. Uh, For the next 10 weeks, we're going to be looking at one psalm each week. So I thought it might be fun as we start uh, to do a little quiz on the psalms. You ready? Don't worry, it's not going to be really difficult. It's multiple choice, so you probably will do fine. All right, I've got like five, five or six questions. First, first question. What is a psalm? A, an ancient prayer, poem, or song. B, a tree in Florida. <laughs> Just to see if you're paying attention, although Florida does sound pretty, pretty good right about now. But the English word psalm actually comes from a Hebrew word that means melody of praise. So the psalms are a collection of of poems intended to be put to music and sung as praises to God. In fact, many of the psalms actually have a a little musical note of instruction for the choir director. We'll point those out as we go through. Question number two, how many psalms are there? A, 23. Somebody laughed. B, 66. C, 150. C, 150. 66 is the number of books in the entire Bible, so I thought I might trick somebody with that, and some 23 people have just heard of. So if you read one psalm a day, uh, you started this week, you would finish at the end of May sometime, and then you could just start over again. And by the way, one psalm a day is not a bad idea. Question number three, who wrote the book of Psalms? Okay. A, David. B, David and a bunch of other guys. <laughs> C, C.S. Lewis. Actually, King David wrote about, uh, scholars think, 73, at least 73 of the Psalms. In addition to David, there are at least six other authors mentioned. You may not know this, uh, including Moses, Solomon, Asaph, not Asap, Asaph, and then the, the sons of Korah, and a guy named Ethan the Ezraite wrote one. That's pretty cool. Question number four. Which Psalm did Jesus quote from the cross? A. Psalm 23, B, Psalm 22. How many vote for A, Psalm 23? How many vote for B, Psalm 22? Oh, you're a very educated group. Correct. Question number five. Which psalm is inscribed on Charles Lindbergh's gravestone? Okay, there's no way you're going to know this. Uh, He was actually buried on the island of Maui in the Hawaiian Islands, and this is his gravestone. If you can read on there... Uh, The inscription reads, If I take the wings of the morning, which is appropriate for a man who flew a plane around the world, if I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, then it just goes dot, dot, dot. But that comes from Psalm 139, which ends with, uh, Even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. It's pretty pretty cool. Last question. Why are we doing a 10-week series on Psalms? A. The Psalms are an inexhaustible source of praise, prayer, wisdom, and spiritual encouragement, touching the full range of human emotions and experiences through which we can grow in our understanding of both God and ourselves. Or B, Pastor Jeff planned the series. <laughs> Answer is actually both. So today we begin, today we begin Songs of the Soul. And by the way, uh, hopefully you picked up your little uh, journal for this series. Uh, called Songs of the Soul. If you didn't pick up one of these over the last couple of weeks, stop by the, the Welcome Center out in the lobby. You can pick up one. It's got all the psalms printed out in here, some pages to take notes in. You can use them in your personal, uh, for your personal devotions or bring them here with you to church so you have room to take notes. But pick one up. It's a nice little addition uh, for this series. But the book of Psalms is a collection of ancient poems and songs that serve as kind of a hymnal for ancient Israel. Now, even though these songs were written... A couple thousand years ago, different time, different culture, they are actually strikingly contemporary, and we'll see that as we go through. I've often encouraged people over the years who are going through some season of difficulty in their lives where they struggle, struggle in their relationship with God, or struggle to to even put words to their prayers. I've often encouraged people just to begin reading through the Psalms until they find one that expresses their heart. Because you'll find it. The Psalms are inexhaustible in terms of their language of prayer and worship and how we understand the God that we worship. And today we're going to begin with Psalm 1, the very first one, and it's called a Psalm of Blessing. So follow along on the screen or your Bible as I read Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, 
nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and all that he does he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Let me point out just a couple of things as we begin in this psalm. Uh, notice the use of common everyday images. It talks about a, a tree planted by water or the chaff that the wind blows away. The chaff was part of the, the wheat, the wheat uh, plant that when it was winnowed, it would just blow away, leaving, leaving the fruit of the, of the wheat. Also notice that the psalm resolve, revolves around a series of contrasts. Uh, not this, but this. Not this, but this. This is actually a theme used often in ancient Hebrew poetry. And finally, notice how uh, there is a repetition. Uh, how thoughts are repeated and then amplified line by line. You're going to see this more clearly in just a few minutes. But the first thing we see in this psalm is the way of blessing. It talks about the way of blessing. Uh, I went to college, and I've, I've told this story and many stories about this time in my life before, but I went to college in a small school in North Carolina called Davison College. Now, Davison was uh, located in a really small town in North Carolina, and that little small town had an ancient water tower just a couple of blocks uh, off campus. Uh, and if you went to that water tower, it was surrounded by a chain link fence with all kinds of signs posted on it. Warning, keep out, no tres trespassing, no climbing, many signs, which of course made it something of a tradition for the college kids to try to climb the water tower uh, sometime when you're in school. So one night, spring of my senior year, I was hanging out with a bunch of friends, very late at night, and someone says, you know, we should climb the water tower. Nobody had climbed it yet. We should climb it before we graduate because it's something of a tradition. Um, and now you need to know two things before I tell you the rest of the story. First of all, uh, I don't like heights. Uh, I'm not, maybe not exactly phobic, but I really don't like heights. I'm uncomfortable climbing a six-foot ladder, let alone a hundred-foot water tower. Okay, that's the first thing. Secondly, most of my friendship group that night, most of them, I don't know if I can say all of them, but most of them have spent the evening uh, imbibing a certain adult beverage, which could have affected their ability to make good decisions. Um, I had not participated in that, so therefore I should have been the one with a clear enough mind to say, this might not be a good idea. But I didn't. We got to the tower, my friends just started climbing over the fence and headed up the ladder. And against my better judgment, against everything inside me, I, I just followed right along with the group. About halfway up that ladder, I had a sudden and dramatic change of heart. You might call it a moment of repentance, profound repentance. Um, I remember praying, literally praying, please get me down from here. I promise I'll never do something so stupid again. Uh, and I eventually got down, uh, but I paid a price for it because the next day uh, I had bruises on my legs, my shins, from my legs were shaking against the steel of the ladder. Look at what the psalm says. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, who stands, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Now, the psalm begins with blessed is the man. When we think or use of the word bless, or blessing, or blessed, we most often think, at least as a culture, of the things we have, right? We think of the things we have, or we think of the nice things that happen to us. For example, I'm so blessed to live in the house I live in. I'm so blessed to have the things I have. Or we say, uh, our family's been so blessed by good health this year. And of course, those things are certainly blessings, but that's not the kind of blessing the psalm is talking about. If we look into the original language, we find that the Hebrew word translated blessed uh, comes from the word esher, which means happiness or contentment, which makes sense to us because uh, we want to, to be blessed is to be happy, is to be content, and nice things that we have or happen to us make us happy. So that makes sense. But if you look a little deeper, we see that that word esher comes from a root word, a root word ashar, which carries a slightly different meaning. It means right or straight. 
Because the Hebrew people saw two uh, kinds of paths in life. There was the straight path, the path that led toward God, and that was the path of God, and they saw the crooked path. The crooked path was the path of rebellion against God. So to be right or straight meant to walk the straight path, you could say, to live the right way with and for and toward God. So yes, blessing is happiness and contentment, but it means more than just possessing a lot of nice things. Blessing in the psalm is not about an event that happens to us, like finding a great parking spot. It's not a thing that we possess. It's actually a way of living. So what is the way of blessing? Notice the psalm focuses first on what it is not. He says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked. And notice the words that I've underlined here because they're related. Nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. Now notice there's a repetition here. There's three sort of parallel thoughts. This is a form of poetry we see often in the psalms. You'll see it as we go through this series. Three parallel lines that are sort of a, 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 that are, are kind of a progression. The way of blessing is not walking in the counsel of the wicked. To walk in the counsel means to think like, to think like or to agree with. And the word wicked means those who think foolishly or immorally. If you go back to my water tower story, uh, the 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 idea to climb the tower was both foolish. And it ignored warnings. Okay, in that way, it was somewhat, it was not right to do. Um, to walk in the counsel of those meant my, was my failure to confront that as a foolish idea. And just going along with the group was exactly what this psalm writer is talking about. Next line is the way of blessing is not standing with sinners. Now, a sinner is one whose behavior misses the mark of God's standard of holiness. To stand with means moving beyond thinking like someone else or hanging out with them to move toward behaving like they behave, which I did when I ignored the signs, ignored the warnings, and actually climbed over that fence and climbed up the tower alongside my friends. So it's not walking with the council. It's not standing with the sinners. And the third way, the third thing it says is the way of the blessing is not sitting with scoffers. Now, to sit with meant to remain with, to, to find your place with. And scoffers is an interesting word. These are those who are more than foolish, who don't just do foolish or sinful things. They actually mock God and his word. Now, notice the progression from walking to standing, to sitting. So taken all together, these three lines are saying that the way away from blessing, the way away from God, the way of sin is progressive. It starts with thinking like, it moves to behaving like, and it winds up with living like. Like me climbing a water tower in college, like, for example, peer pressure in middle school or high school, or the cultural pressure that many of our young people in college today feel about, um, feel from the people around them that, that faith itself is somewhat backward, old-fashioned, and unnecessary, like a business person might feel, you know, feeling the pressure of their business to behave certain ways, like we all feel as the world presses in us its priorities and its standards. The psalm is saying that following the crowd, that, that following, listening to voices other than God's voice is not the way of blessing, leads not to blessing, leads somewhere else. And then verse 2, the psalm points us to what the way of blessing actually is. Verse 2 says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates both day and night. Now, what is the law of the Lord? What does the psalm writer mean? Well, technically... At that time, the law of the Lord was the Torah, what we would call the first five books of the Old Testament. But in the greater context of God's Word today, we know that the law of the Lord refers to the Word of God in its entirety, the truth of God. What does it mean to delight? 
Uh, delight, I read in, uh, I think it was John Piper's commentary, that delight is the response of the heart to that which is beautiful. For example, you stand in front of the Grand Canyon, you take delight in the beauty. It means to find joy and pleasure in someone or in something. And to meditate day and night means to ponder, to mull over, to think deeply about. The psalm is asking us a question. The psalm is actually asking, where do we look for truth? Where do we find truth? Do we look inside ourselves? Our culture tells us today to look inside yourself. Find your own truth. Follow your own truth. Follow your heart. We hear it all the time. Or do we find our truth in God's word and an eternal truth that comes from him to us? Where do, we, where do we look for guidance? Do we look to the crowd? Do we look to our friendship groups? Do we just follow along with whatever they want to do, whatever they say is right? Or do we look to the guidance of God's word? Where do we look for hope? Do we find our hope in politics, for example? Many do. Or science? Many do. Or is there hope found in God's word? Paul says in Romans chapter 12, do not conform to the pattern of this world. Don't think like this world. Don't find your values in this world. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind through God's word, through truth. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So the psalm says the way of blessing will then produce the life of blessing. That's the second thing today, the life of blessing. I'm curious, how many of you uh, remember the little board game called the Game of Life? Anybody have the Game of Life as they were growing up? Okay, it's, it's one of the most popular games uh, of all time. I think it's in the, 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 the Game Hall of Fame. Do you know where such a thing? The, the Toy Hall of Fame. There's such a thing called the Toy Hall of Fame. Well, the Game of Life is there. A little trivia. Um, do you know when the Game of Life was originally invented? The first, very first version of it. Okay, it was invented by Milton Bradley. Not the company, the guy. Milton Bradley in 1860. Okay? It was then reissued in a new form in 1960 by the company that bore Milton Bradley's name. And this is what the board looked like in 1960. Okay? You may have played this version. Uh, the game involves spinning a dial, uh, picking up cards, and making choices. You know, do you go to college? Do you just start work? Do you, do you get married? Do you have children? And then you move around the board uh, to different life destinations. Now, interestingly, when I did a little research on this, uh, the earliest version of this game, late 1800s, early 1900s, had the goal of the game to live a good life. That is, to make good choices, to avoid pitfalls like gambling. There was actually a, 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 a card or a box you could land on, gambling or crime or intemperance or prison. But eventually, when the game was reissued in 1960, uh, the game had morphed into this goal was achievement, success, and wealth. And if you play that game today, the goal is to navigate through all the twists and turns of life and to end up with more money than everybody else. So in that way, the game of life now exactly represents the prevailing values of our modern culture. A life of blessing is what? A life lived in pursuit of and attainment of material wealth. That's the American dream. But that's not what the psalm is talking about. Verses 3 and 4. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. And all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Now notice, again, the use of contrast. This, but not this. The one who walks in the way of blessing, the one who delights in the word of God, he or she is like a tree planted by streams of water. So the first thing about the life of blessing is that it's a life planted. It's a life that's planted. Now the word here, planted, carries the sense of being kind of replanted or transplanted from one environment where the plant does not thrive to a better environment where the plant thrives. That's the meaning of the word. Listen to what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 3. A familiar prayer. Paul writes, I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, notice this, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. So life that is planted has roots that grow down deep into the love of God ultimately revealed in the love of Christ who by faith dwells in our hearts and 
fills us with the fullness of God. This is a life then that the psalmist says yields fruit in its season. So the second thing we see is that a life of blessing is a life that bears fruit. Now what is fruit? What fruit are we to bear? Again, if we jump to the New Testament, Paul writes in Galatians chapter 5, but the fruit of the Spirit, that is what the Holy Spirit wants to grow in all of us all the time, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. The psalmist is saying, and the Bible is telling us, that a life of blessing is a life that bears that fruit. It's identifiable, you can see it, and it's to grow in and through all of us. And the third thing is the life of blessing is a life that prospers. He says, its leaf does not wither, and all that he does, he prospers. Prospers how? What is prosperity to the psalmist? We hear lots about prosperity today. There's a singer-songwriter today named Taylor Swift. Some of you may be big fans, I don't know. Arguably the most successful artist in America today. Taylor Swift just turned 30 years old in December. I had to look this up. She has now sold over 50 million albums worldwide. She has an estimated net worth of over $400 million. She's 30 years old. So according to the game of life, Taylor Swift wins, right? Or she's winning. Or consider the woman we've talked about for the last month or so, Elise West. We've talked about her. We raised some money for her ministry uh, back in December. She's the young woman from our congregation who felt called by God to leave everything she knew, to leave her home, to leave her family, to leave her country, and to go start a ministry for young men with special needs in Ukraine. Elise is not famous. She's not wealthy. There's no card in the game of life that says, leave your home, leave everything you have, and go start a ministry in a place like you. There's no card for that. So according to the game of life, Elise loses. But... Over the last 10 years or so, Elise has raised somewhere over $400,000. And by the way, our December offering was over $180,000, so three times what we were shooting for. Stephen's home is now a reality. These young men are being ministered to. They're being cared for. But which life would the world say has prospered? Taylor Swift, right? Which life does God say prospers? Which life does the psalmist believe is a prosperous life? It says one's going to blow away like chaff in the wind. One's going to blow away, be meaningless. Another is going to bear fruit that lasts forever, the psalmist says. See, the life of less, a blessing offers us a new kind of progression. Not walking with the wicked, not standing with the sinners, not sitting with the scoffers, but a life that's planted that grows roots deep into God's love and truth, a life that bears fruit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and that produces a life of prosperity, a life that prospers. And that leads to the third thing we see in the psalm, and that's the hope of blessing. The hope of blessing. Here's how the psalm ends, sort of the last verse of this ancient song. Verse 5. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Now, uh, as we were preparing this uh, message on this psalm, we all realized that you kind of have to read this ending of the psalm sort of inside out, backwards. Because this is expressed in the negative. Uh, the psalm writer is focusing on the destination of the way of the wicked, the way away from blessing. It says the way of the wicked will not stand in the judgment. The way of the wicked will perish. Meaning that all those who fail to pursue the way of blessing will not survive judgment. Won't survive. Chaff blown away. But if we read it inside out, if we read it sort of backwards, we can see the hope of the way of blessing. Because the positive side of it is the Lord knows the way of of the righteous. And that word knows is a rich Hebrew word. It means more than just sort of being aware of, like I know two plus two equals four. It's not talking about that kind of knowledge. 
It carries a sense of relationship. Like I know my wife. Relationship carries a sense of God who walks, watches over us, who walks with us. The psalm is saying that those who walk in the way of blessing, who live the life of blessing, will be judged as righteous and will not perish. Now what's that language remind you of? Will not perish. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So the way of blessing is taking delight in God's word and truth. The way of blessing is the way of bearing fruit, bearing the fruit of righteousness. And God's word tells us that we are made righteous in Christ. Just last week we ended the message. A little two-part series on being made new. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become, what? The righteousness of God. So as, as this wonderful book of 150 psalms begins, the very first psalm sets a tone. And it's very common sense oriented. We can see it clearly. Psalm is saying there are two ways to live. There are two paths to follow. One is away from God, the crooked way, the way of our own choosing, and the other is the way of God and toward God. One is a way of blessing, and one is a way of judgment. That same year in college, um, my senior year, at some point I, I decided to get a plant for my room thought I should dress up my room a little bit. So I decided on a small cactus, almost exactly like this little guy right here. Uh, I thought to myself, surely I can take care of a cactus. I even gave him a name. His, his name was Herman, uh, after a comic strip I used to like. Um, I put it on my shelf, and I, I kind of forgot about it. You know, I didn't bother to water it. It was a cactus. It's supposed to live forever, right? But evidently, uh, even a cactus plant needs a little bit of water, because toward the end of that year, I went to move my cactus, to move it to a different shelf, and it just, it just fell out of the pot. It just fell. It was completely dead, completely dried out. I had managed to kill a cactus plant. Now, the book of Psalms begins by reminding us that we are kind of like that plant in a way, meaning that we need the water. We need to be watered by to have our roots deep into God's Word. If we plant ourselves in another place, if we plant ourselves where there is no water, if we plant ourselves in the world, in the world's wisdom, in the world's ways, in the world's priorities, we're going to dry up. We're going to dry up and blow away like chaff in the wind. But when we are planted in the truth and love of the God who created us, when we walk the way of blessing, when we live a life of blessing, and then we have the hope, the great hope of eternal blessing. That's how the Psalms begin. Hope you'll stick with us through these 10 weeks. Let's bow in prayer. Lord, we thank you for your word today, for these ancient words of wisdom and truth. Teach us through this series to to take our delight in your word, to drink deeply, deeply from your truth and your love so that we would walk in the way of blessing and live lives filled with your blessing and lives that bear fruit and prosper. In Jesus' name we pray.